So uh, my name is Phil Bednar. I'm one of the pancreatic surgeons here at uh, University of Michigan. And, and this is a cancer that I uh, treat daily and uh, have come to uh, do some research on in my laboratory as well. So today we'll just sort of give the highlights of uh, what we know about this cancer, how it works and how we treat it. And I'll actually tie in a little bit uh, into what Dr. Gerard already presented in her in her talk. Uh, she laid a really nice groundwork for me. So thank you for that. So I think the first thing that we really need to discuss is what the pancreas is. It's sort of something that people most most people sort of know about or may have heard about a little bit, but few really know where it is and what it does. And if you kind of look at these pictures, uh, the pancreas is sort of this yellow organ that's in the back of everything else in your upper abdomen. It sits sort of in the middle upper belly and then it extends over to the left side towards your spleen. And the pancreas in the body has two main functions. Part of the pancreas creates digestive juices that then get sent into your intestine uh, through this little tube that runs along the entire length of the gland. And the other part that the uh, other function that the pancreas uh, carries out is to make uh, uh, hormones that control your metabolism. So your pancreas is the source of hormones like insulin, for instance, and it's critical uh, in maintaining how your body responds to the food that you eat, how it processes it, and obviously plays a role in, in uh, uh, problems like diabetes, for instance. Pancreatic cancer is, and what we're talking about now is, the, is sort of the quote unquote bad pancreatic cancer. And it's a cancer that, that arises in the portion of the pancreas that uh, uh, creates the digestive juices. Uh, it has the ability to spread to other organs uh, fairly early. And what you see here on the left is a picture of a liver from a patient uh, who died from pancreatic cancer. And, and all these white spots are actually tumors that have, that have kind of cropped up in the liver once the tumor had spread from the pancreas itself. It can also spread to lymph nodes, lung, and, and rarely to other sites in the body. The other part to pancreatic cancer and the way most people know about it is the people that they've heard being affected by it. And this included famous folks like Alex Trebek, Patrick Swayze, Aretha Franklin, as well as Sally Ride. And unfortunately, it is one of the uh, cancers that uh, is continuing to increase in its incidence, meaning how many new patients we diagnose every year with this disease, uh, despite uh, all the hard work that people are uh, uh, doing on this disease. So let's talk a little about the risk factors uh, for patients. So we can break them down into two main groups. Uh, on, in sort of one bucket are the demographic or genetic risk factors. These are things that, that uh, are unique to each individual uh, and uniquely affect what the chance is that they will develop pancreatic cancer in their lifetime. A uh, key risk factor obviously is age. Uh, the longer we live, the more likely the chances that we will actually develop pancreatic cancer in our life. And most folks that get diagnosed with pancreatic cancer tend to be in their 60s and 70s. Uh, men have a higher risk of developing this than women. And unfortunately, uh, out of the uh, sort of racial breakdown in the United States, we know that uh, Black Americans are at a higher risk of, of receiving this terrible diagnosis compared to uh, most other uh, racial groups. Obviously, the, these are things that you have no control over. Uh, it's sort of what you're born with, and uh, these are just the things that we know are associated with an increased risk. The other part to uh, kind of intrinsic factors or things that are particular for each individual person are these ideas and, and concepts of genetic syndromes and pancreatic cysts. Now, Dr. Gerard already spoke with, uh, about some of these genetic syndromes that predispose folks to colon cancer and breast cancer and occasionally lung cancer. But it turns out that a lot of them actually also increase your risk of pancreatic cancer development. So in particular, uh, for instance, uh, the BRCA gene was already mentioned that tends to be a, a gene mutation that, that uh, patients know most of because of its association with breast cancer. And, and again, famous celebrities that have had 
BRCA associated breast cancers that had to be treated like Angelina Jolie. Uh, but the other side to this is that uh, the same uh, patients also have increased risk of other cancers, including pancreatic cancer. And there are other multiple syndromes that exist that, that increase this. And these include, for instance, a, a familial melanoma uh, syndrome where patients can have an increased risk of pancreatic cancer and melanomas at the same time. Uh, actually, the Lee Fraumini uh, syndrome also has slightly increased risk of pancreatic cancer that, that was already mentioned in Dr. Gerard's talk. But I think the main idea here is that, that uh, it is important for uh, folks out in the community to be aware that there are genetic risks, although they are relatively rare, uh, to develop this disease. And it's worthwhile knowing your family history and understanding what sort of cancers are present in your family and how uh, they have been treated. And, and uh, when the time comes uh, in the right scenario or right context with the right history, uh, the primary care doctors as well as cancer specialists should be aware of these and, and actually should uh, refer folks for genetic counseling, which is a very key service that certainly our Rogel Cancer Center provides. And, and uh, uh, it is worthwhile to consider thinking about a genetic counseling uh, uh, discussion to see if you could understand what the risk to you as well as to your family members is if there's a history of multiple types of these cancers in the family. The other thing worth mentioning is this idea of pancreatic cysts. Uh, these are findings that we're seeing more and more as we do more CAT scans and MRIs for our patients for various reasons. They often tend to be incidentally identified. Uh, many of these turn out to be benign and don't cause any problems, but there is a subset of these cysts that if left in the body long enough, uh, will require uh, or can turn into cancer and will require treatment for cancer. And so for patients with these genetic syndromes and pancreatic cysts, for instance, there are uh, actually surveillance and screening programs with a combination of MRI and endoscopic ultrasounds that will look for uh, cancers. The other part to this is environment and lifestyle. And these are things that people have a little bit more control over. And we know that, that uh, at least there's some potential link between all of these factors that are listed here uh, and the chance of developing pancreatic cancer. So smoking and tobacco use certainly is, and that's known, that's where uh, it's been very well studied and the, the link is established there. Diet is a little bit more uh, uh, controversial, but we do think that Western style diet, essentially what we eat in the United States uh, in general, tends to make us more predisposed uh, to these uh, cancers along with obesity. Uh, we do know that having pancreatitis, whether it's alcohol related or for other reasons, does significantly increase your risk down the road of pancreatic cancer. The, the risk when it was studied is about 40 to 50 fold, especially for folks that have repeat episodes of pancreatitis. And if a person has received radiation for other reasons, uh, either through treatment or because of some sort of work exposure, uh, that may also affect the risk of pancreatic cancer in the future. So how do we know if you have a pancreatic cancer? These are typically the most common symptoms that are associated with it. And it really has to do with where the pancreas as a gland is, is located again in the upper part of the abdomen. So folks that get diagnosed with pancreatic cancer often have fairly vague symptoms. I wish that there was one particular symptom that would always tell patients you need to worry about this type of cancer. Unfortunately, there is not. The closest we get to that is when folks develop unexplained jaundice, meaning yellowing of the skin, eyes, or nails without pain. That is very concerning, and that typically forebodes or, or, or uh, marks the development of a cancer in the pancreas or in the bile ducts. But a combination and constellation of any of these symptoms, including vague abdominal pain, unexplained weight loss, loss of appetite, nausea, as I mentioned, jaundice already, uh, new onset diabetes, actually, this is a key part, which I'll touch on a little bit more here, and new pancreatitis without clear risk factors. All of these and any of these can mark potential development of pancreatic cancer. Um, it's worth talking about the idea of new onset diabetes. This is something that we've really become uh, more aware of over the last five, 10 years as, we, as we've studied it more, especially in folks that really don't have a lot of other risk factors for diabetes development, and especially in folks that have had actual weight loss 
associated with unexplained new onset diabetes, uh, there should be very low threshold for the patient and the physicians that take care of him or her to think about pancreatic cancer on the sort of list of diagnoses to consider and look for. So how do we diagnose and treat uh, pancreatic cancer? Typically, when there's concern that pancreatic cancer is present, you will undergo a, a combination of these tests. There will typically be CAT scans or MRIs performed to look at the pancreas and the other organs in the body. There'll be an upper endoscopy done, which allows us to do a biopsy of any mass that we find. And there'll be blood work to establish some baselines of tests that we can sometimes use in patients to, to treat uh, when we treat pancreatic cancer to follow their response. In particular, you may hear about a blood test called CA99. This is a substance that a lot of the pancreatic tumors, although not all, uh, that they make and release into the blood. And we can actually use it as a marker to follow uh, the treatment progress because it will drop uh, uh, as the tumor gets treated if it's responding to therapy. And it will actually go back up if new tumors are developing or if new spread is, is happening in the body. For most patients, unfortunately, uh, pancreatic cancer is diagnosed at a point where uh, it's already started to spread to other parts of their body. And again, this is partly the reason because we do not have good screening tests, as Dr. Gerard had already noted, and, and the symptoms are very vague. So often the disease is diagnosed late in its course. However, there is about a 15 to 20% group of patients who at some point either get diagnosed early or their tumor, uh, because of its response to therapy, becomes uh, removable by surgery. And this is where patients come and see me, and we perform a couple of different types of procedures to remove the different parts of the pancreas that may be affected by the cancer. It's less important to understand what, what those procedures and terms are, but I think the key part here is that um, we are trying to work very hard in, in trying to understand how we can sort of help folks get uh, into the treatment uh, bucket that contains surgery more frequently, because really the operation has to be part of the treatment for us to be able to try for a cure. And unfortunately, as uh, again, Dr. Gerard noted already, the uh, rate of success with pancreatic cancer tends to be lower than for cancers like colon or lung cancer, where the treatments are a little bit more effective and the surgery is done more often. So unfortunately, our five-year survival rates, if you look at all the patients that, diagnose, that are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, still are uh, on a range of about 10%. We even, in fact, just crossed the 10% mark in the last uh, couple of years here. Last uh, little bit I wanna talk about is just the clinical trials. There's sort of four main areas that, that uh, clinical trials are, are uh, targeting this disease are being run in, and that includes combinations of uh, immunotherapy treatments, uh, new, new ways of delivering and new mixes of chemotherapy, new ways to integrate radiation into it. Um, and there are exciting trials which are very early in their stages, but showing some, uh, some promise uh, that look at how to target how the tumor is uh, uh, treated metabolically, meaning uh, the tumor uh, sort of uses your body's energy and sugar and proteins in a different way than the rest of the body. And we're hoping that we can leverage that to treat the, treat the disease specifically. These are some key resources, which I think are helpful, and these will be available, uh, I'm told, uh, uh, after the presentation. So I'll leave the, the links here with the, uh, uh, in my presentation. And uh, with that, I will end and uh, uh, hopefully give a little bit of time uh, to other folks uh, for the rest of the talks here.